<clears throat> now, Satan was anointed to worship, but not as Jesus the Son. The same God that anointed his son, who worshiped manifestly in Michael, also anointed Satan, but not as a son, only to an office. Right. Only seed can be anointed with the Spirit unto eternal life. As I gave an example of Eve. <clears throat> she came from Adam, and yet <clears throat> she had to be pregnated by Adam, which was that life in him, which came to her life already there, which was, as we see, a born-again experience. Bringing forth a new member unto Christ in the sense of redemption, and now you go ahead with the Word of God and the power of God to fulfill that which devolves upon us as sons of God, which are to worship and to serve Him. And Brother Branham said, you worship and serve the Lord as you, uh, rather you love and, wor and worship, you love and serve God even as you love your brethren and serve them. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> now, so he talked about Eve bringing forth that child in the, in the correct lineages. Now take that to the rebirth and apply this to uh, the children of, of God, is the, the ones that are twins today, and you look at Israel, and thus you can see that Jacob alone had the birthright. <clears throat> now they both came from Abraham down through, through, uh, through uh, Isaac, and they came through two women. That's fine, there's no problem there. But you see, they were carrying both in their genes the seed which would bring forth unto that which was created, and not that which had eternal life. Now Esau was blessed, but not as a star, but as the sand of the seashore. He had a blessing, but he certainly was not in that sons of God. Now, <clears throat> I want to go to Mark 16, because we, we're taking your time, I'm sorry, but I, I knew I'd be a little bit long tonight. You know, I, I have those flashes of genius when I... I know I'm going to be long, but I got something to show you here. <clears throat> and maybe you thought of it, I don't know. <clears throat> We're going to go to Mark 16, <clears throat> and uh, this is after the resurrection. He, verse 14, he appeared to Levin. He upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not which had seen him after he was risen. Now, they saw him before, and that didn't do it. Then they saw him after, and that still didn't do it. What did it? The only thing that did it was because they were seed. Or they wouldn't have had any chance at all. No way, shape, and form. But God's obligated to his children. <clears throat> he has to be because that's what predestination is all about. Huh? <clears throat> now, 15. And he sent him, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they'll cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, they drink any deadly thing and will not hurt them, they'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. <clears throat> now this is what Jesus said, setting gifts within the church. Setting out gifts after his resurrection. As the Bible said, when he rose, and he went back, he gave gifts. He gave gifts of the fivefold ministry to perfect the bride, and he also gave gifts. And those gifts are found in Numbers and Psalm 68 also. And he gave gifts even to the wicked, the unrighteous, to show the Lord was amongst them. Not in them, but amongst them. To show God, to prove God, to show his word. Now, I want to just check with you on this. <clears throat> and as we check, <clears throat> I'm going to go to Matthew 7. <clears throat> In Matthew 7, he's talking about true prophets and false prophets. And he's talking about what they can do. Verse 22, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and thy name, cast out devils in thy name, done wonderful works? And I'll profess unto I never knew you. Depart from you, me, you that work iniquity. <clears throat> now let's go to Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> and in 24, talking about the time of his presence in the end time, in verse 23, Then if any man say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs, even lying prophets, 
even shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch were possible they shall deceive the elect. Behold, I have told you before. When did you tell them before? <clears throat> In Matthew 7. Now I want to ask you a question. Does Mark 16, was Mark 16 given before Matthew 7 and Matthew 24? The answer is no. Then how come Jesus is warning them about what he is going to set in the church after his resurrection? Did you hear what I said? I'm asking you. Why did he warn them? <clears throat> Why do you say when the gifts are, because these are gifts set in the church, and make no mistake about it, they were set in the church after his resurrection. It was at Pentecost they spoke in tongues and prophesied, right? It was after Pentecost the great miracles were done, right? Make no mistake about it. And he turned right around, he said right at this point, before he ever mentioned and set any gifts in the church, he positively warned them about gifts in the church and gifts extend right oh come on let's find out if it was carried on <clears throat> we go to Acts the second chapter <clears throat> the second chapter <clears throat> Peter is speaking and he said these are not drunken verse 16 Spoken by the prophet Joel, come to pass the last day, pour my spirit upon all, all flesh. A double L. <clears throat> now, if you're going to pour his spirit upon all flesh, all flesh is all flesh. One lump. Any one of the lump. No matter who it is. Let's prove it. Your sons and your daughters prophesy. Your young men see vision. Your old men dream dreams. And on my men servants and my women servants. I'll proud of my spirit in those days. Last two days, Brother Brandon said her here. And now watch what happens at the end time. They'll prophesy. And at the very end time when the signs are multiplied, after Brother Branham came on the scene, even during the time of the latter reign when these gifts began to manifest, the true prophet came on the scene with the true word of God. But they turned the true word of God down because they didn't understand that the warning that Jesus gave concerning the gifts of the Holy Spirit were there because it didn't constitute a genuine anointing of the Holy Ghost himself. It was anointing by the Holy Ghost unto gifts. Now he says, at that time, I'll show wonders in the heaven above, signs and earth, blood and fire and smoke. <clears throat> the great tribulation absolutely comes on at the end time manifestation and proliferation of these gifts, and they're everywhere. And they started back in 1904. <clears throat> and now you got it. And they're right here to the very day in which we live. And Jesus, before he even set them in order, he warned about them. And the church went off in the first century, and Paul did his dead level best to set the church in order, and they wouldn't listen. <clears throat> they wouldn't do it. Now, what is the true church order? Those that are truly born again, having gifts of the Spirit, having that anointing of the Word upon them, knowing the truth. Let's go and find out what the Bible says. We go to Ephesians, the third chapter. <clears throat> and in the third chapter, we find the secret. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundant of all we ask or think according to the spirit that is at work within us. <clears throat> it's the spirit that's doing the work within us. It's not an anointing upon us. It's a genuine positive rebirth of the Holy Ghost coming down upon our souls, redeeming us, sealing us right back to Almighty God. <clears throat> Because you receive the rebirth by the baptism with the Holy Ghost. And at the same time, the church received gifts. They received offices. And there isn't anybody that's not a member in particular, although there's only a true five-fold ministry, but there's a false five-fold ministry. The Bible speaks of false prophets. It speaks of false apostles. It speaks of false teachers. It speaks of false pastors. Then there's got to be false evangelists, and there are because they ran with the false gospel. <clears throat> so here's what you're looking at, where this razor blade is, and people cannot understand it. <clears throat> but the difference is this. The Holy Spirit himself 
has not only in given us the union and the redemption, pardon me, the sealing to the day of redemption, <clears throat> but has also empowered us. And in the empowerment thereof, men can walk. And as Paul said, if you live in the Spirit, see that you walk in it. And when you walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, you are already in the bride of Christ. You're already ordained to your position. But see that you live according to the Word. And the inspiration from that Word, joined with that light, will positively bring forth the ministry. I wanted to be an evangelist. I could, oh man, I used to get so mad when people didn't love my evangelistic sermons. And this is the truth. There's, I've seen them lean forward and grab the benches. And I said, boy, I'm really getting there now. I'll get those white knuckles and get them up here too. Nobody ever came. And they say, oh, Brother Vea, we sure love your morning sermon. My, where do you get that material? I could have gone pow right in the puss, right in the teeth. I didn't want to be teacher. But I'm happy today I am. I, I'm, I'm not an evangelist. I'm not here. I'm not the kind of a, a midwife that brings them to the birth. <clears throat> but you turn them over to me to teach them. I'll do my level best to show them the word of God to bring it all out. I'm not too good at it, but the thing is, at least I know my office. It was confirmed by Brother Branham, so that's there too. <clears throat> but I'm showing you something in here. These people stay with that word. They stay with the Spirit because the Spirit is in the word. And they're not trying to be something they aren't. See? Because it's a life, it's natural. And if you're called to the ministry, you, you, there's nothing you're not going to get away with. <clears throat> if you're called to be a certain thing in life, you won't get away with it. Now here's one thing the latter rain people were great at doing, but they're wrong in doing it. They took the scripture where Paul said, the gift that's in thee by the laying on of my hands. Brother Branham said, you don't get gifts by laying on of hands. The old Philadelphia Confession of Faith knew they didn't get gifts by the laying on of hands. Anybody could get them then. A latter rain, they'd, they'd confer gifts. Oh, they'd lay hands on me, tell me what I've got. And the 16 people told them sifting different things, different things. I used to do some of that too, and I know I must have said some wrong things. Absolutely, I'm sure I did. But I don't remember ever telling any woman she was ever called to preach. But time after time, my women under my hands so nervous. They just, just nervous. You just feel their vibrations moving through it. I said, just a minute. You were called to preach years ago and never obeyed. I didn't know they never were called. They thought they were called. They got married instead, did something else. And their lives were just like this here. Another time a guy sat under my hands and said, my God, man, you're in terrible shape. And something came before my eyes and like a little black and white mental vision. And I said, hey, you spoke in tongues one time and somebody heard that language and knew what it was. And they said, you're a missionary to a certain, to a certain island where those people are. And you didn't go. He said, that's right, Brother Vail. I said, forget it. <coughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Satan just took him out of the word. That's what he did in the beginning. He, you were perfect in all your ways. Hey, you had it made. You're my creation. I anointed you. These gifts, this office, it's wonderful. But you went out of the word. Now, let's go and find out how it's done, shall we? How do you get that way? <clears throat> we now go to Galatians 2 and 20. <clears throat> all right. I am crucified with Christ. Not so. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And you cannot have that word faith outside a word. Because what is faithful outside a definition? And what is definition outside of a word? Only those people that can speak and think and therefore act are the only ones that are intelligent and therefore could understand anything about faith, God, or anything else. The rest cannot. There's no way they can do it. <clears throat> Your mind is the most important thing you have, especially if you're a child of God, and you let that mind get out of the way and do what Paul said. Notice what he said. I have been crucified with Christ. I'm dead. I'm gone. My hands are tied. My feet are tied. I can't get down. I can't do a thing. There's nothing I can do. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of Sunday. He's quoting absolutely Ephesians 3 and 20 in the Galatian manner. I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As he was faithful to the word and now in me, so am I faithful to that word. And there you're getting your picture where we are today. 
I know I cannot cover these things and make them as clear as I'd like to. I don't have the ability, but there we see it. So there you can see it tonight. God has given us the definitive revelation of our origin, our lives, official works, and the end of it all, and how we not only fit into the kingdom, but glorify him, and consequently ourselves by his rewards and the grace and those things that he stows upon us. On the other hand, we see those who are anointed only to an office, but it is of God, created though they are, bestowed and maintained until the day of reckoning which is now. Stewardship therefore entails responsibility unto judgment, either to glorification or destruction. <clears throat> so you see, there's more to stewardship than we thought there was. Stewardship is the whole thing. It's the whole thing. Satan went off that word. He was entrusted to worship God through that word, the precepts, the blueprint, the instructions, the manifest, the manifestos, everything in there. <clears throat> Laid down, and Satan began bending it. Begin bending it. Okay? Now that's where the whole thing lies. Now people want to get it all messed up with works. And they want to say, well, just a minute. The fruit isn't that word. The fruit is how you're acting. No, no, that's not true, my brother, my sister. That's not true. That's not true. You're, you, it's not your acts. Not by acts of the righteousness you have done, but according to his mercy. Paul said, if it's works, it's no longer grace. If it's grace, it's no longer works. <clears throat> You've got to get behind the whole scene and listen to what the prophet said and try to bring it together, which I've tried tonight to show you. And we'll go into more and more of this to show you stewardship. Uh, this, to me, stewardship opens up everything. It opens up the complete understanding of predestination. It opens up the complete understanding of judgment rewards. It opens up the, the anointing of the false, the false anointing. It opens up the whole thing to me. Opens it all up. One of the great keys of the Bible. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, again we thank you for the time we spent together in fellowship around your word, knowing we have learned much, and we pray now, Lord, that it shall go deep within our hearts and become more and more a part of us to realize, Lord, that each one of us, those sons, we do have, we are members in particular, and each one's are steward for those things that you entrusted into our hands. And the great thing, Lord, is that Paul himself said, you made me a steward, said he, of the word. We are stewards with our brother Branham of the mysteries and with brother Paul and with you yourself and the blessed son, the Lord Jesus Christ, stewards of the mysteries of all the grace and goodness from eternity into time and back to eternity again, the stewards of it. May we be faithful, Lord, and not hold back at any time, not try to justify ourselves and not try to in any way add anything or take from, but stand on this word and then as Paul himself said in Brother Branham, <clears throat> asked us also to do. <clears throat> if you live in the Spirit, see that you walk in the Spirit. As he said, if you say you believe me, you love me, why don't you obey me? And that's what we see tonight, Lord, to live within the framework of this word. May we not find it grievous, but may we find it joyful to do so, filling our lives with joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to go to uh, Peter over here <clears throat> uh, just for a little bit for the communion service. <clears throat> and uh, reading in the first chapter, it says here in verse 18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain behavior received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot, who was verily foreordained. There's your foreknowledge, election, predestination. Remember, Jesus was part of the election, and even the scripture talks about elect angels. They have their callings. <clears throat> and no two ways about it. The whole thing is in there. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. You know that Jesus was foreordained to do for the Gentiles what he did for the for Israelites, for the Hebrew Israel. 
In other words, God was obligated, according to Matthew 4 and Matthew 12, according which is according to Isaiah, to do identically for the Gentiles at the end time what he did when he was here in flesh for Israel. And he's done it. He's done it. He manifested it in his soul. <clears throat> See, he's the faithful God. What's he faithful to? Well, he's not faithful to himself because he can't change from being love, omniscience, omnipotence. He can't change from being spirit. The only thing God could ever do is go back on his word. <clears throat> well, he can't go back on his word. You and I can't change what we are. <clears throat> we can get off his word, but not in disbelief. In disobedience, but not in disbelief. <clears throat> you know, so all right. It says here, we have been redeemed, not with corruptible things as silver and gold from our vain behavior, our traditions, the way we were due to the traditions which we got from our fathers. And in other words, <clears throat> no religion of itself can function or bring you to God outside of the intervention of the slaying of the Lamb of God and the shedding of the blood, which indicates, not indicates, but actually shows and demonstrates that Jesus is our propitiation, <clears throat> which a propitiatory act or propitiation is one wherein the wrath of the offended one is turned away from the offender. And the offender, of course, they were Adam and Eve. <clears throat> and from that time on, we have all offended God and been offenders of the Word. <clears throat> but there is one way that God can deal with us. Because you can see from what I said tonight, and what I'm saying now, there's only one way that God can deal with us, and that's by the Word. And if we don't really understand the Word, or have a revelation that word, then tough luck. Let's just lay it out in slang. Tough luck. Now the question is, what are you going to do about it? No, that's not the question. What is God going to do about it? Because he's a redeemer. Redeem means to buy back. Means to get you out of slavery and into freedom of the sonship of God like we read tonight in Ephesians 3.20 and Galatians 2.20. <clears throat> Keep on quoting. If you live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. How do we get them reconciled? Well, there's only one way, and that is blood comes between us and God. Blood comes between us and our sin. And though the sin be red like crimson, and the blood be red, as Brother Branham brought out, you look through a piece of red cloth through red glass, and it's white. I mean, that's been, that's been done in schools ever since we were little tiny kids and before we were born. <clears throat> so we have this beautiful spiritual chemistry where God now, through the blood, has perfected a bride. She has neither spot nor blemish because of that blood. Now, we have something to do with that as we take the table of the Lord. And that is, if the blood is propitiated, <clears throat> and the blood has cleansed us, and the walk in the Spirit keeps us walking in the light, the life in the Spirit guarantees we have the light in order to walk, those things are ours, then that is why Paul said, I believe, in 1 Corinthians 11 there, that we ought to confess our faults and get everything as right as we can at the table of the Lord. So the shed blood, which we take an emblem tonight, has two great values. Number one, it cleanses us from all unrighteousness. God cannot see any sin whatsoever. But then there's a life to reckon with because that life comes back upon us. The next thing is, can God now see that life in action? Many times, no. And that's where the rub comes. But the blood does not allow us to get away where God could harm us or destroy us. But what happens? We hurt ourselves. That's the thing. We hurt ourselves. We hurt others. So now we talk about the fact, okay, 
the blood, the emblem of the wine, perfect clarity, perfect everything. There's no problem. I don't have a problem with God. He doesn't have one with me concerning sin. But I do have a problem with God, and he has one with me. Am I walking in the light? Now, if I'm walking according to truth, <clears throat> then I have every right to go to the blood, to go through Christ, confessing my sin, making things right with people. And the only reason that is because if you start making things right with people, you're not apt to do it again. It's a lesson in there. If, if I made everything right with everybody, that doesn't give me any brownie points. That doesn't make me a, a fine, upstanding Christian as though I've worked myself into a, into a position where God must smile upon me and say, hey, I'm glad you did such a good job. Well, that's partly true, but it's not the, it's not the truth we're driving at. The thing that what we're driving at <clears throat> is this, that you, we are strengthened when we confess our faults and we make things right. We are now to the place of where the Bible says, he that suffers in the flesh ceases from sin. Once we take that place of, of uh, ignominy and shame in which we are involved and we confess and make things right, then things begin to move in the bride and amongst ourselves as they ought to move. So therefore, there is a hindrance that people don't realize that just because you run like a mini penny cost, I've said many times, I can, I can spit on the floor and go to hell, but they can commit adultery and murder you and rob a bank. Hallelujah, forgive me, Jesus, everything is fine. Forget it. Just don't, don't believe that nonsense. See, you can't make the blood do that. You, 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 can't, you can't wrap the blood around your own ideas and creeds and dogmas, nor twist the spirit around with their own creeds and dogmas. That cannot be done. It simply cannot be done. We are, we are celebrating in emblem form two things, the broken body, the shed blood we're looking at. We have healing for our bodies. We have cleansing for our souls. The cleansing for our minds. Except anything that would keep us from fellowship with God. All goes by the board. Now, the life gives us the power to walk in that word. The life gives us the power to be overcomers. The life gives us these things. And we see that there's an interference. There's some obstruction. The thing is, confess your faults. The areas of weakness. It doesn't mean get up and tell everybody your sins. That's, that's ridiculous. That's asinine. That's, that's not the word of God. Area of weakness is a different thing entirely, the faults. Anything personal, we take care of those things. Not long ago, I got a letter from somebody who tried to pull Matthew 18 on me. And I was supposed to come to him. I didn't even know what he's doing. How am I going to go to a preacher that's so messed up in sin and doing so terrible things to his congregation, and I don't know till the whole church has fallen apart? So I, I didn't answer his letter. If I do, I'll just write someday, and sir, I'll say, your, your uh, ignorance... And your arrogance is only superseded by your ignorance and your arrogance. That's what I'll write him. That's not original. I read that somewhere. <laughs> well, I added one word to it, and I thought it was pretty good. <clears throat> but you see, that, that's a foolishness. That's twisting the word of God. So, all right, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper night. Remember, the blood has made us absolutely perfect before God according to what the blood is supposed to do. The next thing, the life. Are we getting out of the way, bringing our own thoughts down, and then doing, even though it's hard to do, doing the difficult things because God wants it to be done. One man once said, do the hard thing. Do the hard thing. And when you've done the hard thing, the rest will fall in line. So well, we, we trust tonight then. We get our hearts clear before the Lord. Let's rise at this time and the brethren come forward. So we pray at this time. Heavenly Father, as we set the emblem before the people, we ask you now, Lord, that even as we've talked about it, and many times we feel uh, maybe a spirit of dissidence, Lord, or not exactly rebellion, but intimidation toward doing those things that require confessing our faults or admitting to certain things in our lives that we know should not be there. Help us, Lord, to... To, to realize that never before that this is the hour when all things are made open to you and the thoughts and intents of the heart, Lord, the even dividing asunder soul and spirit and joint and marrow. This, Lord, we know that all things are open. So judgment already is in the land. Help us to realize that 
and know that we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. And those things like sickness and various ailments and all could be taken away or brought more under control because people are now in the flow of the Holy Spirit through the word of the living God. May, may that life then come forward as you realize that we can get out of the way. We can allow your spirit to come forward. Liberate us tonight, Father, in every way that according to Scripture we can be. And wherein, Lord, there is that liberty according to the word. May we literally pounce upon it by the power of the Holy Ghost to seize it and become ours as we walk in the light, living through that blessed light. May the endless night be really real to us as never before, Father, because this is what we want. And help us in our fellowship and foot washing. To you we give glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take the name of Jesus with you. Take the name of Jesus with you.